The Bible, I want to make this very clear. The Bible is not about rules and regulations. If that's your primary perspective of this manuscript that we lean on as a roadmap, you would become a legalist and not even know it. The Bible is a story about God's love, God's willingness to reconnect, restore, reconcile relationship with his children. And we see that one way in the Old Testament. We see that in a new way in the New Testament. But it's all about being more like Christ because he saved us. And we say, nope, you didn't do this. Get out of here. Or we judge folks. We demonize folks for mistakes that they made. And we made mistakes that were far more egregious. While sin is sin, we we get spiritual amnesia. But let me, let me tell you, somebody got it documented somewhere what you did. There's a screenshot in somebody's phone about a message you sent from desperation. Somebody got a picture or a photo somewhere. Somebody got a voicemail of you going off. And we forget. And we beat people over the head because they don't know how or they don't invest in. Now, does God have a standard of holiness and righteousness? Absolutely. Absolutely. Has God called us to be set apart? Absolutely. But God didn't call us to lead with right and wrong. God calls us to lead with love. God calls us to lead with grace. God calls us to be like him every single day. And guess what? Some days I'm going to get it right. Some days I won't get it right. And when I don't get it right, I need your help to help me up, not kick me when I'm down. It's too many Christians who kick you, what so-called Christians and believers who will kick you when you're down and they don't know all the things that came to that mistake. It was your breaking point. You, you, you weren't in your right mind. You were desperate. You weren't thinking clearly and they didn't give you the grace to figure out how they can help you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Okay, y'all ain't got home. Do we need to go back to the home training series? Good morning, good morning, good morning. There we go. It's good to see you all. I'm Pastor Khali. To our guests and visitors, welcome to Redemption Church. For those of you who frequent here, welcome back. I want to say happy Mother's Day to the mothers in the room today, to the mother figures. Uh, you don't have to necessarily have, um, when, when I say mothers, I'm talking about those who play the role of mothers in some capacity, those who have given birth to actual children. Happy Mother's Day to you. If you could do me a favor, please, uh, to kind of set the tone of our, for our level of engagement, just look at somebody next to you and say, it's good to see you today. It's good to see you today. If you want to give them a compliment, give them a compliment. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Before we read our scripture today, I'm going to invite you to give me your undivided attention. I believe that there is a word, another word today that uh, can challenge all of us, regardless of where we are in our spiritual development. There is a word, I believe, for all of us. So I don't want, even though it's Mother's Day and it's beautiful outside, let's not make this a casual experience. Let's make this a deliberate effort. To hear what God has to say. If you can meet me in Luke chapter 19, I will greatly appreciate it. If you don't have your Bibles, it's okay. The scripture will be on the screen. And it reads as follows. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short and he could not see over, but he was short and he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. 
I must stay at your house today. Verse 6. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him today, say say today with me. Salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Go back to the previous slide, Thomas, if you will. Um, it, it reverse three says he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. He didn't go home. No, Jared, (laughs) he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, say the spot for me. He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Today, we are speaking from this subject, by any means necessary. (laughs) By any means necessary. Mariah, uh, if you will allow me, I want to explain what this expression means. Uh, This expression became famous, it became popular by a political activist called Malcolm X. Malcolm X was one of the individuals on the front line in his own way to be a representative for a disenfranchised, ostracized, isolated, oppressed group we call people of color or more specifically black people. This expression meant it was a demonstration, it was an ideology to suggest whatever it takes at any cost, I will make sure even if it kills me, we get what's owed to us. We are not an inferior people. means necessary. Some of us use this expression today to to demonstrate a sense of motivation, a drive, a determination to get a thing done. Please keep in mind the difference between determination and desperation though, Corbin. Determination is coloring within the lines of the rules. Desperation means you're going to do things even if it means coloring outside the lines. So when we talk today about by any means necessary, I'm talking about doing what is necessary within the realm of what is appropriate, what is right, and what is true. Olivia, I was thinking of a story today to help bring home or illustrate this thought of by any means necessary. I I thought about specific moments in my life where I knew that I had to lock in. I I knew that I had to think deeply about what I needed, what I wanted to get the specific result that was on my heart. I couldn't think of anything that was a demonstration on my part, but I did think of two individuals that I think one of them is a demonstration of what it means to get a specific result. You may know these two individuals. You may be familiar with these two individuals. All I ask is that if you know these individuals, don't judge one more harshly than the other. These two individuals, you know them as Lady Toya and Pastor Khalid. Before I tell this story, she has given me permission, Nate, to release this information to you. And I ask for a disclaimer, please give me grace, This story occurred long before Pastor Khalid even existed. This story was in the realm of my reality before I was saved, saved. This story happened about 12, 13 years ago when we were in the dating phase. In the season of my life, Corbin, Nene, I was a lot different. (laughs) The way I don't say amen, (laughs) y'all. Y'all do this to me every time. I I was a different person back then. What I prioritized was different. The way I valued was different. And the way I handled conflict, Ms. Beasley, was different. I was prone when we got into it in this long, 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 long time ago. I was prone to shut down and to shut her out. I was prone. This was before do not disturb. Before do not disturb, you just shut your phone off when you said, I need some space. 
Toya was a little more diligent. She was a little more persistent, Brother White. Uh, uh, what I did on this particular day, Terrence, was, was I, I shut her out and I, and I shut my phone off as a way to recalibrate. So I went to the movies. I lived in Norfolk. She lived in Williamsburg. That's about from here to, let's say, Gas City, so about 40, 45 miles. And I shut her out, shut my phone off. I went to the movies. I thought I was good. I don't know what movie I saw. I made it through all, all the way through the movie. And then at the end of the movie, uh, uh, the door of the movie theater swung open. <laughs> and the light crawled into the dark space. And out of the shadows, I saw a five foot nothing figure looking in the aisles. And here's what happened in the lobby. You may be asking, did she pay for this ticket? There were a group of young ladies monitoring the front desk. And she said, yo, I'm looking for my boyfriend. And they said, girl, what movie theater is he in? <laughs> She said, I think he's seeing this movie. Honey, you going for free here in movie theater three. They, they, they plotted against me and I didn't even know it, Terrence. They, they plotted against me and that door swung open and she was looking for me. Oh, she got a part of her that y'all don't know exists. Don't let her fool you, y'all. And in that moment, when I saw her, listen to me in all seriousness, there was a sense of validation. Wow. She did all of that for me. She didn't fight me. She didn't cut me. She didn't cuss me out. If you're wondering how the story ends, we're good. But I thought to myself, wow. She did all of that for me. Before we lean into our learning today, I want to ask you a question. As I recall how I felt in that moment being pursued, being uh, 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 Toya's de determination and dedication to resolve an issue, I want to ask you a question today. What can God say about your pursuit of him? I know how I felt in that moment knowing that my wife drove 40, 45 miles just to say, why you shut your phone off? That's drive, that's dedication, that's grit, that's tenacity. But what can God say about us? I know what we say we think we do. I know what we aspire, Zach. But what can God really say about the legitimacy of our pursuit? Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't figured out by now, go ahead, Thomas, Zacchaeus' story it's not just about experiencing God. It's not just about pursuing, pursuing God or Jesus more specifically. Zacchaeus' story demonstrates the potential challenges we face when attempting to experience Jesus. Now, this story on the surface is really a story about salvation, and that is true. But I don't want you to tune out and think that this story is not applicable to you. This story is about anybody in the room who desires to be intimate with Jesus. On the surface, it's, it's salvation, and then there are those who want more of God, more of Jesus, deeper experiences, more intimate, private moments with Jesus. We're not just satisfied knowing him as Lord and Savior. We want to get to know him on a deeper level. And Zacchaeus, he illustrates what we all have to navigate for an encounter with Jesus. I want to prepare our thinking this morning, rather than going first point, second point, third point, as we go through each scripture, I'm going to put an idea on the screen above the scripture, and I'm going to use that as a talking point, and each talking point has sub points. So let's look at the first verse here, and I'm going to begin with the question, who is Zacchaeus? Who is Zacchaeus? This is a meaningful question. Who is Zacchaeus? In answering this question, Darnell, I think we will better understand what he had to navigate and why he had to navigate it because of who he was. See, see what, who we are, not just our first and last name, what we represent yeah. is an indicator of our path to Jesus. What we prioritize 
can be a determining factor on how we pursue Jesus. What people say we mean in the circles and the spaces that we belong to, that is an indication of who we are. So you need to ask yourself this morning, who am I? In answering the question who you are, this will set the stage for your thinking as you attempt to pursue Jesus in greater ways. On the surface here, we have a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. I I, I want to to, to break this down. On the surface, if we don't have historical context, we would think this man got it going on. This man is successful by all objective purposes. According to worldly standards, he has influence. He has power. He has money. He has position. He has status. But what if I told you his success was shady? He was successful, but he was shady. He was successful, but he cut corners. He was successful, but he was immoral and unethical to a certain degree. How do you know this, Pastor Khalid? Well, the answer is in the text. If you don't understand historically his occupation, I'm going to explain to you. He was a chief tax collector. Tax collectors were individuals who were a representation of Rome. They were foot soldiers for Rome to collect a tax for those who lived there, were passing through. And Rome said, I want my cut. You can do whatever you want as long as I get my cut. So what tax collectors would do would overcharge citizens so they can make a cut. So if the tax was X, what tax collectors would do would double, triple charge individuals who paid a tax so they can then get a cut. Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector. In the New Testament, he is the only person with the label chief tax collector. So he had grimy, sleazy, shady dudes working for him. And he got a cut of every tax collection station that there was in this area. So on the surface, he seems like a legitimate dude that should be respected, but he's shady. He's shady. And here's the ironic thing, Darnell, Zacchaeus, the name means pure one or innocent. Hmm. How many of us, before we judge Zacchaeus, we have a calling that is contrary to our behavior? He is called pure one or innocent, but his behavior is is contrary to his conduct. I don't know about you, but I've been in that season of my life, Rochelle, where I know God has called me to specific things, but my behavior is antithetical to what he's promised me. This is a sleazy dude, but God says your name represents pure one or innocent. This is a shady dude, but his name says so much more. What are you called to do and how does your behavior align with your calling? That's a legitimate question. Some of us, we know what we are called to do, but we're going the other direction. We know what we're called to do, but we're just trying to play with it. We're flirting with it. We ain't all in with it. What are we called to do? God says, excuse me, God says, look here, man, you are called for more. You are called for more. Stop living according to worldly standards. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? you. Here's our first thought. Verse three, this man who was successful, this man who was influential, this man who acquired a great deal of status. We see in verse one and verse two, he got it going on, but verse three is interesting. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Here's our first talking point. He understands that there's missing peace or Jesus is the missing piece. <laughs> Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Uh, uh, he, he, he understands that there is something. He senses something and then he suspects something else. He senses that despite my affluence, despite what I've acquired, despite all the things that I've achieved, Maxine, there's something missing. I don't care how much you've accomplished. Everything is merely an illusion of success until Jesus becomes the center of your life. 
He is the missing piece. He senses something is missing. And watch this. He suspects Jesus is the answer to the missing piece. There's something missing within that doesn't give me a sense of gratification and satisfaction, validation that I need. But there's also something missing. Peace. This internal calmness. Like I have all of the things that suggest that I should be fine, and I should sleep well at night, that I should have good friends, that I shouldn't have any enemies. But if I'm honest, the way I've acquired whatever it is that I have, I don't feel good about it. Something is missing. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no dollar amount that can fill the void for Jesus. There is no sense of status or influence that can fill the void for Jesus. There is no number of friends. There is no house large enough. There is no vacation lucrative enough. There is no position powerful enough to fill the void of the peace that you need and the peace you need to be addressed. Nothing. That's that's the thing that I think we fail to realize. Despite the fame, success, influence, power, and wealth, the worldly things that create the illusion of fulfillment, Zacchaeus understands this ain't good enough. He knew something was missing, and he desired an encounter with Jesus. Some of you today may be here, man, I've tried it by myself. I've leaned on these different avenues, but I know something's missing. All God wants is for you to just to make it into his presence. You don't have to know what the plan is after you make it, but God just wants to know, are you willing to make it to me? Can you recognize that one, I am the missing piece? Because if we're honest, we spend a whole lot of time and energy avoiding God as a sub- because we think there are legitimate substitutes that give us the things that only God can give us. I'm going to go there for a second. I say it all the time. There is no blunt that can take you high enough. There is no alcoholic escape that can get you drunk enough. There is no woman or man that can appeal to your sensual, sexual desires because eventually that high wears off. That sense of release, that cathartic moment, eventually you got to come down from that. God is the only thing that is sustainable. God is the only thing not confined to the emotional and physical realities that we face every single day. God is saying, I'm the only thing that will stand the test of time. I'm the only thing that can stand your circumstances. I am the only thing that is an everlasting solution to whatever you face. Because I'm the missing piece and I'm the missing piece at the same time. I'm the missing piece and I'm the missing piece at the same time. Because we're putting things in that spot but it don't give us peace. We trying to fill the void of the peace, P-I-E-C-E, but it doesn't give us P-A-E-P-E-A-C-E. So we swapping out voids. Ooh, I'm talking to somebody right now. (laughs) We swapping out voids. We, We have a revolving door of things in our lives that fill the gap. In one season, I ain't chasing women no more. I'm focusing on my career. I ain't chasing my career no more. I'm focusing on my health and well-being. And all of these things are a revolving door that are not sustainable. That are not sustainable. Here's our next verse. Here's our next idea. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Here's our next thought, my next talking point, barriers and blessings. I'm going to sit in this for a while. Because I think the average Western believer wants the blessing, but they're not willing to fight through barriers. They they, they want to make it to the promised land, but they don't want to go through the wilderness. They they want a, a perfect streamlined encounter with Jesus. And I'm telling you now, anything worth having, you got to be able to fight for it. We don't want smoke. We don't want beef. We want a clear path to the presence of Christ, and it does not work that way. There are some things that we have to endure. There are some things we have to overcome. We want the blessing, but we forget about the barriers. For those of us who are taking notes, barriers are anything or anybody between us and having more meaningful encounters with Jesus. 
I'll say it again, barriers are anything or anybody between us and having a meaningful encounter with Jesus. He was short. You may say, why they mention this brother being short? Back then, the average height of people in this region was five foot five. So I would be considered above average. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> A giant among midgets back then. <laughs> that was only six inches, but it's cool. So if average height was five foot five, theologians and historians agree that he was no more than five feet tall. To put it in perspective, that's the height of my wife, Toya. So this guy was trying to see Jesus in a crowd, but he couldn't. Man, I want to break this down to you. Here's the thing that I want to tell you, too. See, when you grimy and sleazy, people can recognize your deficiency is stopping you from your deliverance, and they won't help you. <laughs> oh, you the little tax collector. <laughs> and I imagine there were some petty folks that probably sang a little song. You can't see, you can't see. Passive aggressive remarks. Because he put himself in a position because of his profession that despite his problem, there was no one willing to help him. And, and, and being short and in a the crowd, there's specific things that I wanna give us today. Uh, uh, so, so being short represents two things, hear me and hear me well. Being short in this context, as, as, I, was, as I was studying, it represents a current circumstance that appears to be a legitimate reason not to get a better view of God. I'm going to say it again. It represents a current circumstance that is a legitimate reason not to get a better view of God. I'm going to take it a step further. We end up settling with the view we have rather than navigating around a reality that's not permanent. <laughs> it's circumstantial. The crowd is circumstantial because of his height. And what a lot of us do is our view isn't good enough, so we settle because of the circumstance rather than problem solving. Let me give you an example, a few exam examples. My job won't let me get more involved. It's a circumstance. And we settle with a distant view or perspective of God. Instead of remedying or rectifying the situation, we say, well, my job. We say other things like, I don't have consistent transportation. I don't understand what I read when I pick up my Bible. These are things that are legitimate reasons to settle for the view we have of God. And so our circumstance becomes permanent because we didn't decide to problem solve. Here, what, what else means to be short? Uh, it represents the, watch this, I need you to hear this. It represents aspects of ourselves that we can't change. And it feels like legitimate reasons not to pursue God or a better view because we can't. This is just who I am. He could have given up and said, I'm short. I can't do anything about being short. I'm going to just go to the crib. There are labels that we have. There are decisions we've made that we can't do anything about. Everybody know. And we use these labels. We use these decisions that we've made as excuses not to get a better view of God. We can't change it up. Oh, it's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. Instead of fighting and maneuvering, instead of overcoming mediocrity, mediocrity and complacency, we settle for a watered down experience and encounter with God. Then we got the crowd itself. I'm, gonna come, I'm coming for you right now. He could not see over the crowd. The crowd represents two things. Generally, the crowd can represent the barriers and obstacles that exist between us and God. But more specifically, here, watch this, I'm going to repeat it. The crowd can also represent the problems people bring when we try to pursue his presence. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. The crowd can also represent the problems people bring when we try to pursue his presence. What do you mean? Tradition? I want to get closer to God, but I don't feel like I fit into this traditional box that they call church. Because people hit me with, we don't do church that way. That's not how we used to do it. You ain't really saved unless you've been in church for three hours. 
You ain't really saved unless you know how to speak tongues. You ain't really saved unless you know how to cast out. These are traditional elements that have been passed on by generation and generation. And we forgot that God sees your heart above all else. He doesn't care about our willingness to feed into man-made rules and routines. And it's the thing that keeps people locked out of church and his presence because of what we do. Here's the second thing, legalism. Those of us who beat people over the head with rules and regulations. The Bible, I want to make this very clear. The Bible is not about rules and regulations. If that's your primary perspective of this manuscript that we lean on as a roadmap, you would become a legalist and not even know it. The Bible is a story about God's love, God's willingness to reconnect, restore, reconcile, relationship with his children and we see that one way in the old testament we see that in a new way in the new testament but it's all about being more like christ because he saved us and we say nope you didn't do this get out of here or we judge folks we demonize folks for mistakes that they made and we made mistakes that were far more egregious while sin is sin we, act, we get spiritual amnesia. But let me, let me tell you, somebody got it documented somewhere what you did. There's a screenshot in somebody's phone about a message you sent from desperation. Somebody got a picture or a photo somewhere. Somebody got a voicemail of you going off. And we forget. And we beat people over the head because... They don't know how or they don't invest in. Now, does God have a standard of holiness and righteousness? Absolutely. Has God called us to be set apart? Absolutely. But God didn't call us to lead with right and wrong. God calls us to lead with love. God calls us to lead with grace. God calls us to be like him every single day. And guess what? Some days I'm going to get it right. Some days I won't get it right. And when I don't get it right, I need your help to help me up, not kick me when I'm down. It's too many Christians who kick you, what so-called Christians and believers who will kick you when you're down and they don't know all the things that came to that mistake. It was your breaking point. You, you, you weren't in your right mind. You were desperate. You weren't thinking clearly and they didn't give you the grace. To figure out how they can help you because of legalism so we got the crowd representing tradition legalism uh oh and then those of us who are turned off from uh, pursuing the barriers overcoming the barriers because of churchy folks churchy pastor what you mean churchy I'm gonna define it for you hypocritical phony antics that appear to be meaningful but really an embarrassment hypocritical i'm gonna say it again just case you i'm not stuttering either hypocritical or phony antics that appear to be spiritual but they're an embarrassment to the kingdom of god i'm not giving examples i'm not going to give examples but, but I do invite you to think about what you deem as spiritual could be churchy. <laughs> we ain't going to hit B flat here, and that's okay. We ain't going to do that because that's not who we are. We have to be authentic in our pursuit of God, not what appears to be spiritual. We must be spiritual at all times. So there's one way I did. If, if you want to, if you, if it's genuine for you to lift your hands and sing underneath your breath, it's about your heart. If you want to sing out loud and sing along, guess what? As long as it's genuine, it's about your heart. God receives it. You can sit down and be in tears because God is dealing with you. There are, we can't get lost in one way to do things. The crowd between us and God can turn us off and we don't even know it because we're, t- because we're intimidated. Watch this. We're intimidated and overwhelmed about the idea of trying to be something that we're not. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. But what I love here, man, is despite the barriers, 
My brother, he didn't go home. (laughs) The Bible says he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree. I want to paint the imagery here. This little dude, who's probably not five feet, little legs, I imagine, was running. (laughs) Think about the potential humiliation. Quailing, think about the, what is he doing? And then running, this little dude climbed up a sycamore fig tree. You talk about dedicated. Here's a rhetorical question. What are you willing to do to make it in the presence of God? What are you willing to do to have a deeper encounter with God? Hey, I'm going to peel it back. Take away the qualifier deeper. What are you willing to do just to experience God? Are you waiting for convenience? Are you waiting for a clear path? Are you waiting for God to come see about you? What are you? And this dude is a tax collector. He just wanted to get a glimpse of him. He just wanted to see him, Tony. He, he, he didn't know that he was going to be blessed. He didn't know that he was going to have an invitation. He didn't know. And he says, I just, I just want to see the man. I'm going to run. I'm going to climb. I can't see. I'm not going to make an excuse about my view. I'm not going to make an excuse about my circumstance. I'm going to run around the crowd. I'm going to climb up this fig tree because I just want to see him. I just, I just want, I just want to look, I just want to see his face. Ooh, that's good. I just, I just want to see, God, I don't want nothing from you. That's good. I just want to see your face. If you don't say anything to me, I just want to sit in your face. And I just want you to know that I pressed my way here to get a glimpse of you. I dare you just to go to God because of who he is and don't ask him for anything. I dare you just to say, God, we just going to sit here, just you and me. <laughs> we, we just, I'm going to just hang out with you for a little while. I'm, I'm going to give you glory. I'm going to say hallelujah. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to say I love you. But this time, I'm not going to ask you for anything. I just want to peek at your face. Mm. Isn't it something how an unsaved man can show us what it means to pursue God? Unsaved, unchurched, but he show us a whole lot. Ladies and gentlemen, where are we with our pursuit of God? We want the blessing, but we don't want to put in the work to overcome the barriers. Here, 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 here's something, verse 5 and 6. When Jesus reached the spot, this is very important, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Here, here's the, the thing that I want to talk about, divine appointment. Linguistically, we cannot assume we know everything about this text. When we see when Jesus reached the spot, we think it's just an arbitrary, random location. <laughs> it's much deeper than that. <laughs> the spot, and when you translate it in its literal meaning, it's more than a random location. It means a designated area or an exactness that reveals opportunity. God has predetermined and destined how and when you cross paths with him. <laughs> the tree was built before it was built with Zacchaeus in mind. The tree had to go where it was, and that's what the seed couldn't be planted too soon or too late because it had to be just right for Zacchaeus in the right location for Zacchaeus to climb it because God knew Jesus is going to save him through that tree. God has divine appointment, but we got to know we're in the right spot. We got to know we're in the right. Where you are is not random. Where you are is not happenstance. Where you are is an opportunity to get to know God in deeper ways. You didn't just happen to be in this situation. You don't just happen to be at this church. God has deliberately orchestrated this moment in time in your life for you to see about him. The spot, the spot. I, ooh, I don't like doing this, but I got to do it. Are you in the right spot? Look at your name and say, are you in the right spot? Are, are you in the right spot? Are, 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 it's a legitimate question. 
And, and watch this. Watch this, Dr. White. God can pass by spaces we're supposed to be. So, like, it's already planned and mapped out for you to get there. But he passes by. Ooh, watch this. If the light is Zacchaeus right here, he passes. Okay, Father, this is, this is the moment where we, okay, cool. But, but I look, because the Bible didn't say he called his name. Jesus did not, the, the Bible does not say Zacchaeus said, Jesus, I'm up here. Right, right. Mm. Come on now. So could it be destined for him to look up to look for Zacchaeus? But I wonder if God is walking through spaces and looking for us in appointed times. He ain't there again. Mm. My grace, I'm going to give them an opportunity to bounce back and restore and we'll see if they listen this time and overcome the fear, overcome the complacency, overcome the mediocrity. I'm going to give them another chance. There's a spot that I need them to be in. There's a spot I need them to be in. There's a spot. Ah, they missed it again. I'm passing through. I'm trying to do something in their life, but they're missing it. They're not in the right spot. And, and, and I'm going to cut back on the barriers. I'm going to cut back on the obstacles. I'm going to make it easier for them to make it to the spot. And, and, and guess what? Time and time again, I missed it again. I, I wonder how many times. And what if the answer to the season that you're in is making it to the right spot? The right spot, the right. This is why you got to be careful who you seek counsel from. Because they will advise you to be in a space that was never designed for you. And they often coach through their lens of experience so they can be preaching and prepping you for their spot that they're afraid to take. And your spot is unoccupied. Mm. <laughs> the spot, you better get to the spot. Your deliverance is in the spot. Your answer is in the spot. Your solution is in the spot. Your breakthrough is in the spot. Your fresh perspective is in the spot. Your healing is in the spot. But guess what? It got, oh, man, I just got an imagery. I wonder, Olivia, when we get to heaven, if God shows us the mountains of blessings that we missed. Not because we black, not because we poor, not because we white, not because we got the wrong, because we weren't in the right spot. Mountains of blessings, mountains of opportunities. And God, this could have been yours, but you weren't in the right spot. This is divine appointment. This is divine appointment. Here's the thing, man. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. We can't process this through a Western lens because you're not going to invite yourself to my house and demand me to host you. That's not how this works. That's through our Western lens. Culturally, uh, within the cultural context of Eastern realities, it was appropriate. It was common for individuals to invite themselves. And it wasn't, hey, come next week. It was, sure. Come. It was an honor to be able to host on the spot like that. Here, here's, here is the question that I want. I'm asking a lot of hard questions today. Uh, uh, um, do we take a Western approach when Jesus invites himself in? Okay. Or we take an Eastern approach where we say, come immediately. Or do we say, God, give me two weeks. I got to clean up. I got to prepare for your company. I, I got to get things in order because here's the thing. We, y'all know how we do when company come. You ain't seen that toilet, the bottom of that toilet bowl in years. And you create the illusion that your stuff is sparkly clean all the time. Ain't nobody got that much Lysol in the world. We want to clean up and prepare for Jesus' visit when it's convenient. But he knows the condition already before you clean up. Watch this. 
He knows the condition of your heart. He knows the status of your, your, your lived reality every single day. So you prepping for a visit, he already knows what's going on. So we keep telling God, when, he got, when, when Jesus is saying, yo, just, just invite me in. I want to come today. Yes, sir. Oh, no, not, not, not today. I, 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 I can't. I got to work some things out in, in my family. Not today. I got, I, got to take, I got to pay these things off and I got to work a few more hours at my job. I, and not today. Not, not to, God, you, you, know, um, you know my heart. We, we got an understanding. We got a relationship. God is saying, invite me in. Invite me in. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Oh, I love that, that, that phrase, gladly. Because some of us invite God reluctantly. And some of us obey, ooh, watch this, with an attitude. Say that. Oh, I'm coming for you today. I told you this is more than just, a, just salvation. This is a message that challenges, challenges the posture of our minds and hearts when it comes to experiencing Jesus. He says, invite me today. We say, no, not yet. And if we say today, we have to monitor the disposition and the attitude that we own in our yes, because we can say yes with an attitude. We can say yes out of compliance and not commitment. See, when I'm committed... I want to do it. When I'm compliant, I'm just following the rules. Man, that was good. (laughs) Some of us say yes out of compliance. I obey God's word. I pray because that's what he told me to do. But I obey God's word. I pray to God. I spend time with God because I'm committed to him. Mm, Where are we today? Next thought, and then we're going to get out of here. Verse 7. All the people saw this. (laughs) And began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Man, y'all gonna free, I'm gonna free you this. Watch this thought. Watchers and whisperers. (laughs) Whoever told you people will be silent about your salvation, they lied to you. In fact, people talk more when you're trying to be better. People talk more when you set yourself apart from the crowd. People talk more when you say, it's time for me to mature and be different. People talk more when you say things like, no, I'm going to stop cussing. People talk more when you say, no, I'm chilling out on the drinking. People stop more when you say, no, I'm not on that fornication anymore. People stop more, uh, they talk more when they say, no, I'm not going out like I used to. You become a target because of your tenacity. So you got those who watch. And then there are those who whisper, and then there are those who do both. But you better believe you're not pursuing God in a vacuum. You don't get the luxury of pursuing God and making mistakes and growing with nobody watching. There are people who watch out of speculation. There are people who watch who need an excuse to pursue God for themselves. And then there are those who whisper, hmm. Yeah, what happened, bro? You fake now. You got all fake on us. You didn't join that redemption church. You you, you don't respond to my, you used to respond. Johnny on the spot used to kick it with me. What up, bro? And and it's, it's, it's a question that ultimately is designed to discourage. See, see, there are two types of discouragements, ladies and gentlemen. There's discouragement through watchers and whisperers to dissuade you because of their own agenda and preferences and their their discouragement for you to pursue God. Watch this because of the labels and the history they know you have. They feel you are unworthy, undeserving to experience God. Man, you've done way too, what? You going to church? Or they've watched you try to commit to church before. They've watched you want to be serious before and you end up back at square one. So when you try a second, a third, and a fourth time, the fourth time they're going to be more vocal about, bruh, all right, well, wow, watch what happened again. They, they are discouraging you because of your history. Right. But watchers and whisperers, this, for me, they motivate me to stay on my A game. Come on. Come on. 
Here's the thing, man. While I live for God, I'll be lying to you that there's a part of me that doesn't live through the lens of I'm not giving anybody an excuse to question the legitimacy of God in my life. I'm not going to be a part of anyone's spiritual traumatic resume. I'm not going to be a part of anyone's journey to say he's just like anybody else. While God is real to me and I love him and the Holy Spirit operates in my life, trust and believe I'm doing what I do so the watchers and the whisperers ain't got nothing to say. And if they do say something, it ain't true. (laughs) Here's what I've learned in life. This is just a free nugget. Somebody needs to hear this. We're so consumed about what people have to say. Watch this, though. If your number ain't in my phone, and my number ain't in your phone, for you to contact me directly to get the information you need, I'm not wasting time and energy about your opinion about me. You know me vicariously and superficially through a computer screen or telephone screen with social media. That's how you know me, and that's it. If you want to draw conclusions superficially through that, I can't afford to think about your opinion. So keep watching, keep whispering, and keep doing both. Whatever it is, I'm going to keep living for God. I'm going to keep pleasing him. I'm going to keep glorifying him. And here's the thing. My, my, my pursuit of God, it ain't your business anyways. <laughs> if you tend to your spiritual business, maybe you'll grow a little bit. If you look at your own insecurities and paranoia, maybe you can address some things in your life. But I'm going to handle mine, and you handle yours. The watchers and the whispers, they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner, this dirty, sleazy tax collector, chief tax collector. So just before we are serious about God, there's always somebody to throw a label in your face. Hold on. The alcoholic? Huh. The adulterer, the cheater, the liar, the schemer. They, they want to throw the label in your face, and some of us, that's all we need to say. Dang, they right. God, there's no way God, there's no way God can do. No, I, I've done too much. That's a trick of the enemy. All right. A lot of times, ooh, this is good. There are people in the crowd that say things that become the determining factor for us to disqualify ourselves. Yes, sir. To disqualify ourselves. All right, we're going to get out of here. I prom- I feel like I should just close. I just said that like three times. Like, for real, y'all, we're coming to a close. All right. Verse 8. <clears throat> but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything... I will pay back four times the amount. When we experience God, you should be able to speak to an influence of Jesus Christ. May I say something bluntly and candidly with compassion and love? There are too many of us who claim to experience God, but we ain't changed. There's no fruit to suggest The power of God has influenced us in any way, shape, or form. I ain't judging. I'm speaking objectively. And if you have a problem with what I've said, reflect on what you've done beyond pretending, playing, legitimate fruit that you've produced that you believe in. The influence of Jesus. This man says, look, Lord, despite what people say, Corbin, He says, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. Half of it to the poor. Then he says, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Here are two things here that suggest he's been influenced by Jesus Christ. He has remorse. Remorse is regret due to guilt of past wrongs. Again, I'm I'm, I'm going to just shoot straight today. How can we say we're saved and we've been transformed by the power of God and we've never been convicted about what we've done to people? There should be something in us to say, dang, now that I know how to love, now that I know how to give, now that I know how to demonstrate grace and mercy, there are people that should come to your mind to say, I did them wrong and I need to make it right with them. 
So not only is he, is he remorseful, he finds a resolution. This is the best that I can do right now. I'm going to pay four times, according to the law of the old, I'm going to say it's Leviticus or Deuteronomy, somewhere around there. They were only required, I believe, 20%. It was only 20%. But he said four times the amount. Four t- Do you hear what I'm saying? Four, not just I'm going to make it right, but I'm a, four times the amount. Man, look, it, every, everything that I have, I'm going to split it in half. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to just give to the poor and go to a soup kitchen. I'm going to give up half because that's my way of finding restoration in a community that I robbed. I can't undo the pain and the damage, but this gesture, this act. And see, here's the thing. Repentance and resolution and remorse require action. When you've been in the presence of God, when you've been in the presence and and Christ's spirit is influencing you through the Holy Spirit and he's directing your path, you should be inspired to want to do something differently. But if Zacchaeus would have had this experience and he would have went right back to what he was doing, can we say, oh man, I'm not being judgy, but really, what are we doing to say God has had an influence on my life? Go ahead, Tom, Thomas, last one. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to his house. I'm ready, Darnell. Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost validation through Jesus Christ. There were several people that could have put their mouth on him and what he was trying to accomplish. But Jesus, Nene, spoke up and said, today, salvation has come. This man is saved. I don't care about what he's done before this. His confession, his repentant heart is an indication that his encounter with me is real. And today, He's experienced salvation. Today, you can't write him off anymore. He will inherit the kingdom of God. Today, I am validating the legitimacy of his heart. Friends, family, here's why I'm focusing on this point briefly. You are waiting for affirmation from man. You're waiting for man to say, good job. You're waiting for man to say, you've grown. You're waiting for man to say, you really are saved. But God is looking for you to seek his voice as the ultimate indicator of whether or not your salvation is legitimate. To a degree, we all value that feedback, but it can't be the primary indication. Quaylen, we got to lean into God and ask God, God, are you pleased with me? God, is my time with you superficial? Are you getting anything from me? Am I receiving anything from you? Or am I just going through the motions of church? Am I going through the motions of listening to podcasts? Am I going through the motions of listening to YouTube and sermons and reading your word? Am I getting anything from you, God? And he said, today, salvation has come to this house. Here's the other thing, not just waiting for man to validate you, you stop trying to convince people. Let your life speak for you. Let your life be fruit and an indication that God is real to you. That you're spending time with him in meaningful, productive ways. We want to defend ourselves. Man, I've learned in my life, and when you get to a point, and this is where I thank God for his faith, when you get to a point of you for real, watch this, you ain't even got to defend yourself. When people put their name, their mouth on your name, there are people in the room that you ain't in that would defend you. No, that ain't the Larry I know. That ain't the Jamarcus I know. That ain't the Toya I know. That ain't the Nathan I know. <clears throat> people will defend your reputation. So they'll come to you and say, man, they tried to talk about you, colleague. Don't worry, I shut it down. <laughs> I shut it down. Man, but we want to convince people you ain't got to sell your salvation and you don't need man to solidify your salvation. Why? Because they can't see your heart anyways. Hmm. This is a word of encouragement for somebody. I don't know who it is. Some of us try harder through pretending for the affirmation. And if you pretend long enough because you're waiting for the praise, you become an actor at salvation. 
So you're acting salvation rather than aspiring to be more in your salvation, you become a master pretender. Because the only way man can validate you and applaud you is based off what they see. So I act out more, I do more because I want people to see me and I want to receive, yo, good job. That's the definition of churchy. That's the definition of hypocrisy. That's what hypocrisy means. It means to be an actor, to a pretender. Big idea. Intimate experiences with Jesus require effort. It requires effort. We cannot take a casual approach to commitment. How can I casually commit my mind, my body, my spirit, my whole being to God? Pastor Chris, how can I casually say I give my all, but I just when it's convenient? That's a paradox. I can't say I give my all, but when I'm comfortable. I give my all, but when it's convenient. I give my all, but when there's a clear path, it requires effort. You gotta press your way through the watchers and the whispers. You gotta press your way through the crowd. You gotta press your way through the obstacles and the barriers of the inconvenience because Jesus matters that much. An unsaved man shows us the power of persistence. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I need you to think about what is keeping you from experiencing Jesus. He got the spot ordained for you. But what's keeping you? Who is keeping you? And sometimes it may not be external things. It could be things we believe about ourselves, obstacles we put in our own way. What's stopping you from a better view of God? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. A word that pricked, that challenged us to think deeply. We've all, I think, we desire more, we desire to grow, we desire to develop. That's great. But how bad do we want it? Are we willing to be talked about, embarrassed, humiliated to get a better view of you? Or are we waiting for opportune times to pursue you in the dark? You want willing vessels. You want eager vessels. You want vessels who are unashamed to seek you. And God, I I, I believe this word motivated some of us to try a little bit harder. We know what those obstacles are. We know what those barriers are, but let us press through. If we gotta press through, Let us press through. If we got to run around the crowd, run around the obstacles, give us the strength to do that. If we got to climb over some things, let us climb over it. But God, we got to make it to you. Orchestrate those things accordingly, God. All for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand clap of praise, if you will.